Welcome, church. If you're a visitor, you're our honored guest. We're glad you're here. Our uh, wireless microphone is still uh, sometimes working and sometimes it doesn't, so I'm going to stay behind the podium. Ed is ordering us, uh, uh, looking into ordering us and uh, looking at different styles of the lapel mics. But today we're going over part two of Will You Serve God Just Because He is God? And this is a survey of the book of Job, and I don't want to do much of a review of last week's sermon because I have so much to cover today, but you remember that the book of Job gives people encouragement. For hundreds of years, the book of Job has given people uh, encouragement during trials and tribulations, and it also stresses the sovereignty of God, and we're going to talk a lot about both of those today. An outline of the book of Job is Job and his adversary, chapters 1 and 2. And you might remember briefly that uh, Job was, well, if you go to Job 1 and verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. You drop down to uh, verse 8. God calls Job his servant, and he says there's no one on earth like him. And he says the same thing in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. So Job does not know when, when he's going through these sufferings, various trials and sufferings that he goes through, he does not know why he's going through them. And it may be that he never knows why he's going through them. And God has revealed to us what happened in chapter 1 and 2 with Satan approaching him and asking permission to test Job because basically Satan was saying he's only serving you because you're blessing him. If you take away his blessings on earth, he will not serve you anymore. And so we covered chapter 1 and 2 last week. Um, we also tapped into some of the life lessons that we can learn from chapters 3 through 37, but we're going to go over some more of those today. But the, the outline continues. In part 2, uh, you have chapters 3 through 37, which is Job and his friends. And then you have Job and his God, chapters 38 through 42. And so we're going to pick up on Job and his friends. And the first thing we want to look at is his three friends, Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And as we stated last week, one of the, one of the things that they did was sit with him for seven days in silence. And that is probably the best thing they did, is visit him and sit with him in silence. Because when they open their mouth, they reveal how miserable of comforters they really are. And we've all probably had those people in our lives that they might mean well. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But really, they're not a source of encouragement. And that was what was happening with Job's three friends. And in these poetic discourses between his friends and him, there's several cycles. Um... Their conversation with Job is found in chapter 3 through 31, and then we're going to talk about in 32 through 37, uh, another individual named Elihu, Elihu, E-L-I-H-U, is going to come on the scene. But one by one, Elphaz, Bildab, and Zophar, one by one, they each basically say that, Job, you're suffering as a result of some terrible thing you did wrong, your sins. Righteous people are not punished and, and they plead with Job to repent so that God can bless him again. And here's a sample of their speeches because that covers most of the book and we can't cover 42 chapters in um, a brief period of time. So let's, let's go over just a sampling of some of their speeches. Elphaz. Job 4, 7 through 9, most of my scriptures are going to be in chronological order of the text. Not all, but most of them. So Job 4, 7 through 9. Remember now 
whoever perished being innocent. So Elphaz is saying, you know, you're, you're suffering, you might be perishing, and, the, and people don't, don't suffer and they're, that, are not, uh, that, are, that are truly innocent. So you must not be innocent, Job. Or where were the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow wrongdoing and those who sow trouble harvest it. So you're just reaping what you sowed, Job. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they come to an end. So Bildad, we're going to look at Job 8 and verse 20. Bildad says, Behold, God will not reject a person of integrity, nor will he uh, help evildoers. So he's not helping you because you're an evildoer and uh, you're not a person of integrity or he wouldn't be rejecting you. Uh, Job 18.21, certainly these are the dwellings of the wicked and this is the place of him who does not know God. See, sometimes their words are even cruel. There's places where his friends even attack his dead children. Zophar, Job 11 and verse 14. Zophar says, if wrongdoing is in your hand, put it far away and do not let malice dwell in your tents. He's trying to get him to repent because he thinks he's done something terribly wrong. So what we, what we got to realize is although the book of Job is inspired, the words of Job's friends are, it's an accurate record of, those, of their accounts, their speeches. But those speeches do not always carry with them the, uh, the will of God. They're inspired as being accurate, really recorded. But the, Job's friends do not always express what God, um, God's will is, what God believes. Job defends himself against his friends, and Job insists that he is aware of, he's not aware of anything that he's done that, to deserve such suffering. And he notes that the wicked often um, prosper while the innocent suffer. Here's a sampling of some of Job's responses to his friends. Let's look at Job 7 and verse 20. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your target so that I am burdened to myself? Job 12 and verse 2. Truly then you are the people, and with you wisdom will die. See the sarcasm Job is speaking to his friends? Wow, you really know so much. If you pass away, then all wisdom is going to perish with you, is basically what he's saying to his friends. Job 16, 17, there is no violence in my hands, and my prayers are pure, or my prayer is pure. So he, he professes that he's innocent. Job 21 and verse 34. So how dare you give me empty comfort? For your answers remain nothing but falsehood. They are miserable comforters. And Job 27, 4 through 6. My lips certainly will not speak unjustly, nor will my tongue mutter deceit. Far be it from me that I should declare you right. Until I die, I would not give up my integrity. I have kept hold of my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not rebuke uh, any of my days. So again, Job, uh, Job is hanging on to his integrity and his righteousness. He's, a, he's not aware of any sin that he's done, that he deserves these. When we come to chapter 32 through 37, um, after Job's three friends' speeches, a man by the name of Elihu talks with Job. And Elihu rebukes Job, saying that Job has spoken irreverently of God in his former conversations with his friends. He's been listening. Elihu's been listening to these conversations. And Elihu declares that God sends suffering to bring about eventually good results and that we are not to question his wisdom but submit to him. Now, at the end, when you get to chapter 42... God's going to rebuke uh, Job's three friends, Elphaz, Bildab, and Zophar, saying that they have spoken wrongfully of God. 
But God does not rebuke Elihu because Elihu did not speak wrongfully of God. Now, he might have spoke, uh, it might be debated uh, erroneously in regard to Job himself, but he did not speak wrong of God. Here's a sampling of Elihu's speeches. Job 33, verses 8 through 13. Job 33, 8 through 13. You have in fact spoken while I listened, and I heard the sound of your words. I am pure without wrongdoing. I am innocent, and there is no guilt in me. He's probably referring to what Job said. Behold, he invites criticisms against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. Job, he's quoting Job or summarizing Job and what he said about God. Behold, let me respond to you. You are not right in this, for God is greater than mankind. Why do you complain to him that he does not give an account of all his doings? So when we look at Job and we consider that uh, James refers to Job in James chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, and it talks about in older translations the patience of Job, but a better translation of that would be the endurance or the perseverance of Job. Because when we think of patience, we might not think of someone uh, complaining. And Job did a lot of complaining about his circumstances. But he never falsely accused God, and he um, was... He was patient in the idea or the definition of endurance and perseverance. He kept his um, loyalty to God during all of these trials. And we got to see the end of the story, how it turns out that he's going to be blessed. And this is going to, his disease is going to be reversed. But Job didn't know that. Okay, Job uh, chapter... 37 and verse 23 is another sample of El Hughes speech. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not violate justice and abundant righteousness. So uh, El Hughes does stand up for the justice of Almighty God. Let's look at some important verses that we can learn lessons from in this section of Verse or chapter 3 through chapter um, 37. And the, the, we're going to pick up on Job 19 and verse 25. Important verses in the book of Job. Job 19 and verse 25. Yet as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand on the earth. Now, if you... Go and read the next verse. It says, Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. He believed in some sort of life after death, perhaps even the resurrection. And uh, verse, um, verse 26 refers to that. And Job 19, 25, and 26 are the basis of the song that we sung before the sermon. I know that my Redeemer lives. That comes from the book of Job. Way back in the patriarchal age, our God had a plan that could be known. And Job had faith in a future Redeemer who would one day stand upon the earth. And we know, he didn't know who that was going to be, but we know it's Jesus Christ. The Hebrew word for Redeemer in the Old Testament is the word Gael, G-A-A-L. The idea of Agel was a kinsman who would stand and plead the case, defend, and vindicate their relatives. And there's various ways that they did this. But it's, it's a beautiful phrase, Gael. Our song, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, is based on the idea of Gael and Job 19, 25, and 26. And I thank Josh for leading that for us today. Who is the one who shall stand at last on the earth? The ultimate redeemer, the ultimate Gael, is the one who will plead our case and vindicate us 
as only the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can do. In Isaiah 59, verse 20, a Redeemer will come to Zion and to those in Jacob who turn from wrongdoing, declares the Lord. So he comes to Zion. We know that Jesus walked upon the earth and did go to uh, Jerusalem, where Mount Zion is. Like the song title of page 250 in our psalm books, Jesus is the Great Redeemer. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 says, You shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus redeemed us or purchased our redemption with his blood. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, In him, that's in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace and then Colossians 1, 13 and 14, For He, speaking of Jesus Christ, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom uh, of His beloved Son. Or I should say the He there is God the Father. For God the Father rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. That's Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And in no other. There's many things that we could say about the kinsman redeemer Gael in the Old Testament and their responsibilities. Uh, and Christ would fit all of these. The, um, and I'll, I'll make this available, this uh, information to you later on. But uh, Christ, um, Christ would fit all of these. The Gael provided an heir for his brother who died. Uh, the Gael redeemed the land a poor relative sold. And the Gael, or the kinsman redeemer, would re redeem relatives who had been sold into slavery. And the Gael would avenge the murder of a relative. And these were all responsibilities in the Old Testament of a kinsman redeemer. And Jesus Christ, our great redeemer, uh, fulfills these. In Christ we are blessed with every spiritual blessing He provides for us. Because of sin, we all lost our first estate in the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life, but through Christ we will receive a new heaven and new earth. So He redeemed uh, uh, the land that was sold. Um, he buys us back. We were once slaves to sin, and He has bought, uh, bought us back with His blood. And then he's slain, or he's our, uh, he avenges, um, he, as a gal, he avenges his, the murder of his relatives. And we were slain by Satan and sin, and Christ redeemed us from spiritual death and avenges our death. Those are all ways that Christ fulfills that. Why was Job persistent in following God? You ever ask yourself that? What was it in Job? Or what developed in Job? What, um, what was it that made him keep on keeping on? What kept Job from giving up? What kept Job from quitting God when things got difficult? One of the things that kept Job going is found in Job 23 and verse 12. Job 23 and verse 12. I have not failed the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. There's the answer. Remember the recent sermon, How to Cope with Life, based upon Psalm 119? How did Job stay true to God? Job answers, I've treasured God's word. I have treasured God's word. Job says, I've treasured the word of his mouth, God's mouth, more than my necessary food. And he thought that God's word was more valuable than his physical needs. And when we put that much emphasis on the word of God, and we love God's word that much, and we want to apply it to our lives, and we, we dedicate our lives in, in that ambition, then guess what? We can be like Job 
And when difficult times come our way, we're not going to quit God either. That's what made him persist. Do we realize just how valuable God's word is to us so that we can persist in a faithful, God-pleasing Christian walk? In Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus himself says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Do you view God's word as necessary substance? Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And Jeremiah 15, 16, your, word, your words were found and I ate them, and your words became a joy to me and a delight in my heart. Like Job, we should view God's word more important than our necessary food. We also learn um, from Job chapter 28, we learn a definition of wisdom. Job 28 verse 12, verse 20, verse 23, and verse 28 to save time. Job 28, 12 says, But where can wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Drop down to verse 20. Job 28, 20 says, Where then does wisdom come from, and where is this place of understanding? Drop down to verse 23. God understands its ways, and he knows its place. Drop down to verse 28, and you get the answer. Job 28, 28. And to mankind he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. So there we have in the book of Job, um, divine wisdom defined. Proverbs backs that definition up as well. In Job 29 and chapter 31, those two chapters, Job is going to go over parts of his life and and express the good deeds that he did in his life. And he's basically going to state, he's going to reveal the positive things that he did prior to suffering, and he's going to state, that if he had done certain negative things, he would be worthy of suffering. But he had not done them. And I'm going to give you just a sampling of chapter 29 and a sampling of chapter 31. In Job 29 and verse 3, When his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through the darkness. You know, God's word is a light into our path. And so he's, by God's light... Job was walking through darkness. In Job 29, 14 through 17, look at how he expresses some of his righteous deeds. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a headband. Verse 15, I was eyes to those who were blind and feet to those who could not walk. I was a father to the poor and I investigated the cause of which I did not know. I broke the jaws of the wicked and rescued the prey from his teeth. And when you read chapter 29, you'll see how Job went about helping his fellow man, even from the wicked who were trying to devour them and their substance. In chapter 31, verses 5 through 8, we see another picture of Job's righteous deeds. If I have walked with deception and my foot has hurried after deceit let him weigh me talking about God with accurate scales and let God know my integrity if my steps was turned from the way or my heart followed my eyes or if any spot has struck to my uh, stuck to my hands let me sow and another eat and let my crops be uprooted so he is he is indicating that he is Uh, living a righteous life and is not suffering uh, because of doing some terrible sin. We also learn in chapter 31 verses 1 through 4 and then it picks up uh, a continuance of this subject in verses 9 through 12 how Job kept his eyes from lusting after women. And this is an important passage for many people that you know in the years gone by Uh, you had to go through some embarrassing 
situations, it was much harder to, to uh, go about looking at pornography than it is today. If you own a phone and you have connection to the Wi-Fi, you have access to uh, pornography. And these, these are important texts to encourage people to abstain from uh, lustful uh, views of others. Job 31, 1 through 4, I have made a covenant with my eyes. That's important to do. How then could I look at a virgin? And what is the portion of God from above, or the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not disaster to the criminal and misfortune to those who practice injustice? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? In other words, you can't, even when you look at a woman with lust, or a woman looks at a man with lust, vice versa, you're not going to, God knows, you're not going to get by with it. You're not going to, you might fool other people, but you're not going to fool God. Drop down to verse 9 through 12. If my heart has been enticed by a woman or I have lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind grain for another and let others kneel down over her. For that would be a lustful crime. Moreover, it would be wrongdoing punishable by judges. For it would be fire that consumes to Abaddon, which is a place of destruction, ruin, perish, and would uproot all my increase. He realized that the blessings he had, if he would go down that path, that it would lead to destruction and a removal of blessings. Again, he is professing his innocence. Now this brings us to the chart that you have. Suffering is not necessarily due to sin. It, suffering can be because of your sin or the sins of others, but it's not necessarily due to your own sin. Job has not suffered because of his sin. Job's suffering due to the sin of Satan. Satan is the cause of his problems. He doesn't know that. He even thinks that God is doing this to him. And, but it's God who allowed it to be done to him, but Satan's doing it. We may never know the reason for our suffering, and Job probably didn't, unless he was the one who wrote the book uh, and it was revealed to him by inspiration as he was writing it. Uh, we're uncertain from lesson one who wrote the book of Job. But we can trust that God will help us endure the uh, trial of suffering that we're going through. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, He's promised that he won't put any more on us than what we can bear. So look at some of the reasons people suffer. This is taken from two sermons that I preached here at Hill Street in 2018, and I just summarized them in 10 points. Uh, some suffering comes from our own wrong choices, which may include sinful choices, and sometimes we make wrong choices that aren't necessarily sinful, and we bring uh, suffering upon ourselves. Some suffering comes from the wrong choices of others. Maybe it's the wrong choices of your parents or the sins of your parents or your spouse or your children, and it brings ramifications into your life. The, a third reason for suffering is some suffering comes from past generations. And the, the, the sins of our forefathers uh, affect us. Maybe um, our living conditions, maybe our... A financial state, maybe our health. Um, maybe we pick up on those bad habits and we continue those sinful behaviors. But some suffering also comes because of natural laws. We have to respect the laws uh, that God have put, has put in the natural world. If there is a hurricane warning and you know about it for a week, and you decide to sit there and not leave town, and you are physically harmed or, or die, then you can't blame God. You know, it's your, God has put natural laws. He's even given us in this the wisdom to be able to, to interpret some of them. You know, he, he's given us the natural law of, of gravity. So it would kind of be stupid to jump off of a three-story or four-story building, you know? Um, we have to respect those laws. Some suffering is because is beyond our explanation. Like Job uh, could not understand, but we understand the end of the story with him. 
God can allow and use suffering, which uh, does not necessarily have to come from him, but he can allow it to test us and our faith, to nurture and mature us, and to develop us. There's a plethora of verses there. God can allow and use suffering to demonstrate or prove to Satan and to the world that we are loyal Christians, and that's what uh, God is really doing with Job. And God can allow and use suffering to teach circumstantial lessons to others and bring glory to God, um, like the man who was born blind in John chapter 9. That was to teach others and to bring glory to God. God allowed and used suffering to remind us of eternity and so that we can have a desire to leave this fallen, sin-filled world and be with Him. And God can allow suffering so that Christians can share in the suffering of Christ and identify with Him when we suffer, especially for righteousness' sake. And then I, I, I put on the bottom six questions to ask ourselves when we suffer and what to do if the answer is yes. And you can look at that at home. Now let's go to Job and his God. Chapters 38 through 42, the end of the book. Throughout the book of Job, Job had many questions for God. And I'm going to summarize them, a few of them. Why does God not seem to hear me during this time of my suffering? I've heard a lot of people ask that. Why does God seem to be punishing me? Why does God seem to, be, to allow the wicked to prosper? And yet the righteous are, suffer from time to time. Well, when we get to this last section, Job chapter 38 through 42, we might be surprised, might even be disappointed. God doesn't answer Job's question or questions. And he doesn't even answer the question, why is, uh, is God doing this to me? He doesn't even say, Job, it wasn't me. It was actually Satan. God doesn't have to defend himself. God does not say, I was not doing this, Satan was, nor does God answer any of Job's other questions. In Job chapter 38 through 39, um, I'm going to give you, a, um, this is where God starts to talk and he starts to ask the questions and he's going to uh, put Job in his place and Job is going to be humbled. In Job 38, verses 1 through 4, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens the divine plan by words without knowledge? Now tighten the belt on your waist like a man, and I shall ask you, and you inform me, Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And he's going to ask a lot of questions to Job about creation of the cosmos and its order. God challenges Job to explain the wonders of the cosmos. Where were you, Job, when everything was created? Where were you, Job, when I created the animals? And guess what? Job was silent, just like we would have been silent. Job's quickly humbled. You go to Job 40, verses 2 through 5. Job 40, verses 2 through 5. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? This is God asking Job. Let him who rebukes God give an answer. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insufficient. What can I say in response to you? I put my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply, or twice and I will add nothing more. He saw the sovereignty of God. And we need to see the sovereignty of God. God does not have to answer to anyone. God is beyond and above mankind. And he is not obligated to explain his actions to us. However, God is also good, merciful, and loving. And because we know the type of sovereign God that we serve, we can bow down to him in obedient submission and love. Again, God poses still more questions with which Job could not answer in chapter 40, verses 6 through chapter 41 through 30 and verse 34. Job 46 through 8 says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind and said, 
Now tighten the belt on your waist like a man. I will ask you and you instruct me. Will you really nullify my judgment? Will you condemn me so that you may be justified? You know, basically Job's been saying this ain't fair. God never said life was fair, but he's, he's just. Job just doesn't know how God is being just in allowing this to happen. But I thank God and I thank Job for going through this so that we can reap the benefits when we read the book of Job and we understand the end of the story whether Job did or not. Job, why are you so presumptuous as to question my judgments? Job, I'm God. I don't have to give an account or explanation to you. I don't have to explain why some suffer and others don't. I'm God and have orchestrated the entire universe. It is enough that you know I am God. And Job 40 and verse 14, Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. In other words, he's God saying, can you save yourself? And of course, we can't. Job 41, 11, Who has been first to give to me that I should repay him? God doesn't owe us anything. Whatever is under the entire heaven is mine, God says. And so Job begins to see the greatness and the majesty of God. And Job is brought into penitent submission. Job 42, 1 through 6. We're at the last chapter of the book. Everybody turn there. Job chapter 42, 1 through 6. After God peppers Job with questions after question uh, regarding the workings of the cosmos, he sees Job's reaction. And Job reacts by submitting to the sovereignty of God. Job 42, 1 through 6 says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no plan is impossible for you. Who is this who conceals advice without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I do not know. Please listen and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of... You by the hearing of the ear, by, uh, but now I, my eyes see you. Therefore I retract and I repent, sitting on dust and ashes. Now he wasn't suffering for anything that he did wrong. But he was complaining and questioning, why is this happening to me? And he thought God was doing it. And he's repenting because he was not respecting the sovereignty of God in certain times in the, uh, in the discourses. We, like Job, have, learned to trust God's, have to learn to trust God's faithfulness in things we cannot fully grasp. If God can create and operate the cosmos, then a faithful child of God can put their trust in God and endure the suffering of this life, knowing that God is in control and that we are near and dear to Him. And I'm talking about the faithful child of God. We are loved by him. God then denounces Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar and vindicates or justifies Job in Job 42, 7 through 9. It came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Elphaz the Timnite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is trustworthy as my servant Job has. Job has spoken in reference to God what is trustworthy. And God is saying that Job basically basic position is correct. But Elphaz, Bildab, and Zophar have not spoken right concerning God. How many people, even those who claim to be Christian, have, spoken right concern, have not spoken right concerning God? 1 Peter 4.11 says, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who speaks actual words of God. I believe the King James would say as the oracles of God. We pick up in verse 8. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him so as not to do with you as your foolishness deserves Because you have not spoken of me what is trustworthy as my servant Job has. So Elphaz the Temite, Bildad the 
Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job. And so Job, God tells Job's friends to go bring sacrifices and have Job, Job pray for you. And Job 42, 12 through 13 says, The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep. His sheep is doubled. He had 6,000 camels. Those are doubled. A thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand female donkeys. Those are doubled. Think about the land that you'd have to own to be able to handle all those livestock. Verse 13, he also had seven sons and three daughters. He, got, he lost ten children, but he had ten more. In Job 42, 16 and 17, after this, Job lived 140 years. Remember, he lived during the patriarchal dispensation when people had longer lives. And he saw his sons and his grandsons four generations. So uh, it seems to indicate that he got to see uh, his great, great grandchildren, I believe. Maybe great, great grandchildren. Something like that. And Job died an old man and full of days. People are, what we learn from, from this end chapter is people are capable of overcoming suffering in this life, especially with God. Will a person serve God just because he is God? That's another major lesson. The theme of the book, Job did. And he proves that you and I can too. How did it work out in the end for Job? Now, he didn't know this. It was going to work out the way he did. Doubly blessed. But James 5, 10, and 11, James, uh, the brother of half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, he writes, As an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. The latter state of Job was greater than the beginning. James uses Job as an example of perseverance to teach us that if we stick in there, that our end will be better than our beginning. How will it work out for you? Will you serve God just because He is God? We know what Job didn't know. We know the end of the story of Job. And that assures us that if we stick it out, Job didn't know this, but if we stick it out, we know that we're going to be blessed. Look at some of these blessings. Mark 10, 29 and 30. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in, this, in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Matthew 10, 22, Jesus is speaking to his apostles, but it, it applies to us. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. You can't start the Christian walk and then quit halfway through it and think you're going to have eternal life. You've got to endure to the end. Matthew 10, 22. Some of those that don't endure to the end are uh, found like in Matthew 13, 21. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Remember those, the, 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 the grain or, or the seed that was sown on the stony ground? James 1, 12 is a good commentary of the book of Job. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation or, or trials. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Are you enduring so to be blessed and receive the crown of life? True Christianity is not a means of escaping from harsh realities of life. 
It's not a health and wealth gospel. It is a source of strength for facing the harsh realities of life. True Christianity demonstrates God's concern for the sufferer. He does not allow any trial to come upon his people which is greater than they can bear, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And he rewards those who endure their trials. Romans 8, 18 says, For I, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And this concludes our survey of the book of Job. Will you serve God just because he is God? If you have not obeyed the Savior invitation, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, to go into all the world, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age or the world. That's the Great Commission. Most of us, as I look around, we're disciples, but how well are we following our Master? Are we making, trying to make other disciples? Are we trying to sow the Word? Are we trying to grow and learn what other things Jesus taught so that we can be prepared? Are we spending time in God's Word sufficiently so that when disaster strikes our life, your life, You'll be like Job and you'll persevere because you have valued God's word more than your necessary food. Will you come as together we stand and sing?